Good morning, Faith Fellowship. So wonderful to be here this morning. All of our family online, we are so glad that you could join us today. We, we are celebrating today once again God's grand provision for our church family in having this wonderful place to meet. And God is faithful. He is on time. He is perfect. He is merciful. He is kind. He is everything that we need every single minute of every single day. And he just astounds me continually with his goodness and with his faithfulness. Today we're going to be looking at a topic that has really been near and dear to my heart. And that is that God is building a family. You are part of that family. All the things that we just sang about, he's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He is all of those things. And those things about God absolutely are the undoing of each one of us. Because he is revealing himself to us in countless ways. And we're going to look at what our responsibilities are as being a part of this grand and amazing family and all that that comes with so many privileges and responsibilities. So let's ask the Lord to be with us in great power today as we look at 1 Corinthians this morning. Thank you so much, Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, for your unending love for each one of us. We are in awe that today we are one day closer to going home with you. Each day we're closer to that appointed time, and we cannot wait till that day comes, Lord. Until then, we know that you are continuing to teach us your ways, to mold us and refine us and change us. Thank you for that. Thank you for not leaving us in the condition that we're in, but continuously changing our hearts and, and putting them in tune with who you are. So be with us, sweet Holy Spirit, as we look at this tremendous passage from Paul that each one of us would hear what you have to say to us because we ask in the mighty name of Jesus and for the sake of his very soon coming kingdom, amen. So we just sang about all the things that we are and we are a, an amazing group of people according to God a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says treasured possession. What for, why are we chosen? What is the purpose that we may declare the praises of him like we were doing in singing, that we may declare his praises? You are amazing, God. You are perfect. You make a way for me. You heal my soul. You change my heart. You adjust my attitude. You refine me every single day. How is it that you are so mindful of me and everyone else, all almost 8 billion people on this planet? How is that possible? He is so amazing, and he is calling us every day out of darkness into more light to understand him, and to declare who he is. So as God's children, we are also ambassadors. As Christ's ambassadors, God is using us, wants to use us to take the message of how great he is to the world. And in order for us to tell about how wonderful God is, how merciful he is, how faithful he is, we have to know that by experience. We have to be experiencing this God that we just sang about, all those wonderful attributes, they're all true. Are we experiencing those things for ourselves? The Father is perfect. Jesus is perfect. The Holy Spirit is perfect. They love us with an unending love, working tirelessly every single day to bring us into line with who they are. And, and with their plan for our lives. It's tremendous. And so God is making his appeal to the world through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We're, we're to be telling those around us, come back. Be a part of this family. Come away from the world. Become a part of, 
of this tremendous family, God's love for you is beyond words. And we witness by our own experience. David says, come in here, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. When last week we were looking at the passage, it says, be prepared to give an answer. But it's not be prepared to give just a statement about who God is. Be prepared with everything, with who he is to you. Just giving someone facts is not enough to invite them to become a part of this family. Let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you what my life used to be like. Let me tell you who I was until he came and invaded my life. Let me tell you how he's changed me. This is who I was. This is who I am. I'm on the road. He's changing me every day. I'm not a completed product, but he is going to finish the work that he started because he is faithful. That is my God. And so this is the appeal is to make God appealing. It is our job to make God appealing by telling others how incredible our God is. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you plan for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. There's too many times for me to tell you because, well, I don't keep a journal like some people do, so I can go recall these things, and my mind doesn't recall them as well as I would like them. So I need to be telling everything that I can remember about who God is to me, what he's doing on my behalf. So then when God changes our hearts, we are changed. We are no longer living for ourselves. We are living for him. Part of being a part of God's family is being an ambassador, being part of a holy nation, being part of a priesthood. All of those things are people who represent him, who live for him, who are living an example for others to see and to be drawn to. Are others drawn to you because Jesus lives within you? That's the question to ask yourself. Am I drawing others to Christ by how I am living? Not by, not by reciting Bible verses. I mean, God's word is tremendous. We need it every day. It's our food. But are we attracting others to the kingdom by how we are living, by the attitude of love that we are projecting? Open up your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read these passages, and then we are going to look at each, each verse. But I want to, um, we're going to look at 919. And I want to, um, you to keep in mind this word that you're going to notice five times, the word win. Your Bible may say gain. But the word that Paul is using in this passage uh, Cardeno is, means, it's a business transactional word. It means to make a profit or to trade up. You know, back in Paul's day, if you didn't have money, you traded for stuff. And, you know, kids do that sometimes. I'll give you, you know, five marbles for this. And, and the, you know, ooh, I got the best trade. You know, that's what Paul's looking to do. He's looking to profit God's kingdom. He's looking to trade up for God's kingdom in the way that he is living his life. So keep that in mind, what his intent is in, in this passage, how he's living his life. He wants to win, to gain, to trade up, to profit God's kingdom. And therefore, he has adopted a Christ-like attitude. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, the Mosaic law, I became like one under the law, though myself I am no longer under this law, as so to win those that are still under the Mosaic law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak, 
I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Wow. Tremendous passage, just jam-packed. He lives above reproach, never compromising the truth. He says, I am subject to God's law, but I am not under the Mosaic law. However, I adjust in order that I can make an impression on others. So let's look at this. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave. How many of us ever grew up think, when I grow up, I want to be a slave? I want to be a slave to Jesus. Because, I mean, what, when you think about slavery, what's the first thing that comes to mind? <laughs> yeah, no choices. I can't do what I want. And isn't that what we have to fight every day, doing what we want? He's made himself a slave to everyone. That even goes beyond serving, to be a slave. To For what purpose? His purpose is to profit the kingdom. He doesn't live for himself. He knows that we are not our own. We've been purchased with the most tremendous price that could be paid. The blood of Jesus paid our ransom. And so his life and his purpose is to win as many as others. And I think about a bond, a bond servant or a bond slave. Back in, in the Jewish days, um, sometimes Jews owned Jews because if you owed money, you, there was no declaring bankruptcy. You went and worked your debt off. And there were times uh, even when, when there were slaves that were owned by Jews at that time that were treated so well that when the time came for them to leave, they didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay right where they were because a life out there in their freedom would not be as good as a life with their master. And when that happened and you were going to be a bond slave, then that master would take an awl, would, which would be like a, like a, a, a screwdriver, a really thin one that they used for a tool for leather, and they would put your ear to the door, a, a hard surface, and pierce your ear. And that would be a mark that you forever would belong to this master voluntarily, that you chosen. Paul has chosen to be a bond slave to Christ. There is no other place for him to be. He wants nothing to do with his own life, with his own way. He wants to live for Christ, to win for Christ, his entire business in life is to be accessible to Jesus so that he can be used in any way possible to win others for the kingdom. That is his sole purpose. And because of that attitude, God used Paul in an incredible way. He almost single-handedly took uh, the gospel through all, out of Euro all of Europe and just had an incredible, incredible zeal for loving God and living according to his purpose. So to, to be profitable for God, what he said he's doing is I'm giving up my own will. I'm giving up my own way, my own ease. I'm giving up my own pleasure. I'm giving up my own rights, my, my own profit, that I might save the souls of all that Jesus brings my way. Not everyone, because he wasn't going to get to see everyone, but whoever Jesus brings my way, whoever I have the opportunity to talk to, to, um, to cross paths with, I want to leave a mark for Christ. I want to make a deposit. Because many times we're planting seeds. We're not going to see the, the end result. But there are times in a person's life, and I think you can, we can all say this to some extent, people, many different people have planted seeds in our life. And God uses all of those seeds from all of his children to grow a person and to make an impression. Paul did not want, uh, not want to waste one opportunity. So he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. Now, this is interesting because by heritage, 
Paul was a Jew. In fact, he says, I, not only was he a Jew, he was a Pharisee, which, which was a leader of the Jews. And he says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees and the worst of sinners. So he has left that behind. When he met Jesus and he learned at the feet of Jesus, when Jesus came and, and blinded him on the road to Damascus and gave him a personal experience, um, he left Judaism behind. And that meant, you know, the temple services and the, um, the rituals of killing the lambs and, and the ceremonial rites and everything that went with that all pointed to Jesus. So when Jesus arrives, we let go of that to take hold of him. And the Jews were having a really hard time with that. And he wanted to rescue the Jews from the mindset that keeping all of these rites and ceremonies was going to give them salvation. That salvation came through Jesus, that these things were just a shadow of what had come. So he had a huge, huge burden for the Jewish community. But since he left all of that, he says, when I'm amongst them, I become like them. I, I talk with them. I eat whatever foods that they're eating. I, even though I don't consider that um, necessary, I do it to gain an audience with them. Because what I understand is not as important as me being able to be used by the Lord. So he is willing to have a humble attitude in order that he might reach whoever it is God is sending him to reach. He's learned from, from the way that God um, arrested his attention that pride had to go. And we know that, that Paul is very transparent about his pride because he writes all about it in Romans 7. And Romans 7 and Romans 8, you know, great passages for us to, to look at of his, his mindset. But he had such a great desire to... Um, stand for the truth, but not deal with disputable matters. Just put them away. Don't argue about senseless things. He says, when I'm with the Gentiles I, I do, who do not follow the Jewish law, they don't know about it because you know, he was always dealing with mixed groups, Gentiles and Jews. He says, but when I'm he's mostly dealing with Gentiles, he doesn't talk about these things. And in fact, remember that he even chastised Peter greatly at one point, because Peter was trying to impose Jewish uh, laws on the Gentiles. And he said, what are you doing? We're trying to get them away from this so that they can take hold of Christ. These things were a shadow, and they're beautiful, and they're worth every minute of study that we give them, but they're no longer valid. So get away from that, Peter. So he adjusted how he needed to for the sake of, of giving and sharing Christ with anyone that he came in contact with. But God's law was different from the Mosaic law, totally separate. He's not saying he didn't keep God's law. He's saying, I will not compromise God's law, but the rest of the stuff I'm willing to bend. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to win the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. And then I do all of this. He's willing to humble himself for the sake of the gospel, to tell others that God is building a tremendous family. Come and be a part of it. Meet Jesus Christ, your creator. He has paid a tremendous ransom to save you from sin. Come and join his family. He wants to share in that blessing. There's nothing that brings him greater joy than being used for God's kingdom. Nothing. And so Paul uses this filter. He did not provoke opposition. When he went amongst people and he, uh, they were, had different customs and they were doing different things that he may not agree with, he never provoked opposition. He never did things to make people angry, to stir up their passions, because what would that have done for his witness for Jesus? It would have destroyed it. It would have closed ears. When people are irate, and we're living 
in, in Earth's history at a time where there's so much unrest. People are upset about the smallest of things. And there is, as Jesus says, as the increase of wickedness uh, happens, the love of most will grow cold. And there's no consideration for other people except just what I want, how I see things, my own opinion. He didn't provoke opposition or needlessly offend. Now, there's sometimes that just by standing for God's word, you're going to offend. The fact that I won't conduct business on the Sabbath will aff has offended some. You know, I've had different things that had to happen at school that needed to be fixed or whatever, and it's like, well, the most convenient day for me is Sabbath. Well, that doesn't work for me. You come another day. So, you know, I can't help if people get offended, you know, for when I'm doing the right thing. When you're doing the right thing, just from doing the right thing without saying a word, you're going to offend people. And Paul did that. But he's, not, he's talking about disputable, disputable matters that just don't matter. For example, think about this and think what you would do in this situation. There was a time when Paul wanted to go and speak to a group of, of, um, of men that were coming, uh, fin finishing up a Nazarite vow. And um, they didn't really want to listen to him. And one of the leaders said, if you'll go over there and if you'll shave your head, they'll listen to you because they'll see that um, you're, you're really serious about wanting to reach them. So he shaved his head. Not a big deal. His purpose was to share the gospel with others. And having uh, discernment comes from being in tune with the Holy Spirit of when to do and when not to do. Accommodation was his strategy. If I have to do this small thing to be able to leave a God print on someone's heart, to be able to share a message of God's salvation, I'm going to accommodate that. He was flexible. He adapted because he wanted for people to be receptive. He knew when it was time to say something and it was when it was a time to say nothing. And that came, that was wisdom that came to him from the Holy Spirit because of his <coughs> desire. He had laser sharp focus on Jesus. It's all that mattered to him. What, what I have to do? It's no big deal. What a small price for what's been done for me. Anything God asked me to do, what a small thing. When Timothy and, and Paul were on one of their journeys uh, and they were going to uh, be addressing a Jewish community, Paul knew that Timothy needed to be circumcised. So he circumcised him. He knew that that was, that was a mark of Judaism. All, all Jewish men were, were circumcised. And if Timothy was not circumcised because he was young the Jewish community, the elders he was going to try to reach, weren't going to listen to a word that he said. However, when Paul and Titus were on a journey, Titus, and that was because Timothy was part Jewish. Titus, on the other hand, was Greek. So when it came time to talk about circumcision, Paul said, there, there, Tim, Titus doesn't have to be circumcised because it's not going to afford the gospel anything. It's not, it's not going to help anything except for this group over here is just going to get more entrenched in the Mosaic law and, and, and want to shove that down people's throats. So he knew when, because he was in tune with God and his purpose was sing only wanting to please God, to testify for him, and to win others for the kingdom. That was his purpose. So all these other things in the peripheral, they just didn't matter. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Greeks, Jews, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. Try. You can't always please everyone. But he says, I try. Interesting, this goes along with what we've been studying in Romans 12. To live at peace as far as it depends on you, try. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many. We can't stand on one thing that's going to take down a lot of people's uh, desire to listen because we want to be right about something. And if we all decide to be right about something, we're all going to wind up being alone, isolated, because that's not how it works. Submission and having discernment from the Spirit is imperative. Jesus says, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. Therefore, be as wise as snakes and as harmless as 
as a dove's. When you see a little dove come and fly next to you, are you afraid? No. That's, that, is, that is how we're supposed to be. We are to be harmless. We're not to be provoking anger. We're not supposed to be confronting people when there is no need. We're not supposed to stir people's anger up for absolutely no reason that is not a spiritual reason. We are not carnal beings. We're not living for the world. We're not living for ourselves. We're living for Jesus Christ. And we must be willing to be humble beings in order to be used to bring others into this family. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. All the things that Paul just said, I deny everything. My, my own rights, my own ease, my own pleasure, my own will, my own way. Deny themselves and take up their cross daily. This is a daily thing that we have to do. It's not a one-time decision. Every day we have to decide again. Because if I have a successful day yesterday where I managed to crucify my pride, when I wake up this morning, it resurrects itself as I wake up. And so I'm doing the same battle all over again. If we want to be his disciples, we must take up our crosses daily, deny ourselves, and follow him. So what are the qualities of an effective soul winner, an effective ambassador Someone who desires life to, I want my life to be a prophet to God. Not a prophet to myself, not to gain for me. I want for my life to be a prophet to God. I want my life to be used to gain something for God's kingdom, to trade up for God's kingdom. It starts here. Nothing can happen without humility. Unless we're willing to slay pride and to allow the spirit to have his way in us through humility. Humility is the foundation for love. We cannot love without humility. So it's imperative that we come before the Lord and we bow down before him and we acknowledge that he is God over us. That he is boss over us that he gives us the assignments that we need every day, that we don't make up our own assignments because we are servants. We are his servants. And what does a servant's heart look like? Is to show honor and respect to every person that we come in contact with, whether you agree with them or not. That is a servant's heart. That is humility. When we bow up, When we stand, when we, you know, don't tell me what to do. That's not a servant's heart. That is necessary for me to be effective, to be someone that God can use, not, oh, there goes Letty again asserting herself. Yep, I meant to use her for this, but there she goes. Big mouth engaged. Now I'll have to have someone else come to to the rescue over here. We get in the way of the Holy Spirit when we don't have humility. And in our, from that comes love and respect for people. doesn't mean you have to agree with them. You can disagree, and you can still have love and respect for someone and treat them. In Romans 12, we read, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Be careful how you see yourself. Don't, don't think too much of ourselves. Remember, that's what happened to Lucifer. He thought way too much of himself. We need a selfless attitude. Selfless. That means God is first, others are next, and I'm last. Love the Lord your God, then love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, now what is there? Oh, yeah, there's you. There's me. I think we'll be so busy with the first two, we won't have time for the number three, actually. And the other is to maintain a Christ-like example. And I want for us to focus on maintain. We must be resolved. We must be resolved to allow the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is an everyday decision. This is why very few people, very few are walking with Jesus today. There's a lot of church-going people. There's a lot of scripture-reciting people. 
A lot of people studying God's word, a lot of people singing a lot of hallelujahs. But there are very few truly wanting to be transformed to be like Jesus. It's painful. Just me keeping my mouth shut is painful. Not to speak of all the other stuff that has to happen. The refining, the pruning. God has big shears for pruning. When God's finished pruning, have you ever seen a, a bush that's been pruned? It looks so <laughs> ugly. But then, whoa, when it th- goes through the right seasons and it gets what it needs, it flourishes and grows. God is pruning us. He is refining us in the refiner's fire. We are in his hands. He is molding us, and it's change, change, change. We kind of like to get comfortable and just sit in a nice, comfy chair, and anytime there's change, we're like, oh, not change again. But we can't stay where we are and go with God. There has to be change. And maintaining a Christ-like example is so important. Every day, we have to go through these things. I want to profit God's kingdom. Lord, please use me for your glory today. It starts by me acknowledging who he is in his goodness. Every time that you start your morning, please start it that way. When you come before the Lord, remember who you are in Christ. You've been called out of darkness into the light for what purpose? To declare his praises. Lord, you are so good. Thank you for another day. You are so faithful to me. Thank you that I get to sleep in a, in a warm house or in a cool house, depending which way you like it. Um, you know, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of this is because of you. Thank you and thank you and thank you. Because that puts us in a place of humility. When we acknowledge that all that we have came from God, hmm, you don't really do a whole lot. Yeah. (laughs) God's given me all of this. He's doing all the work in me. What am I doing? I'm playing my yes card. Yes, Lord. That I have choice to allow that change, to allow him to make me a refined ambassador every day. I have the choice to make to allow him to change me. This is where we need to be, is maintaining by reading the word and allowing these words to change our hearts, to fill our hearts. We can't make things up for ourselves of how we want to live. We have to take God's word and what he says and allow that to change us. Because God says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do you want to be a part of this few? Only a few are willing to be soul winners. Only a few are willing to lay their lives down and be a living sacrifice for Christ. Only a few desire to walk humbly, give up their rights, their opinions, their ideas, in order that they might win others over for Christ. Only a few. Jesus says that narrow is the way and small is the gate. And how many? The masses are going to find it and go through it? No. He says only a few. This is the few. Their greatest desire, our greatest desire, must be to win others over for the kingdom. And that's only going to happen If we are in love with Jesus Christ, if he is the Lord of my life, if I know without any doubt that he loves me, then there is nothing that will be more important than living for him, than wanting to look like him, wanting to talk like him, wanting to think like him. How many rights did Jesus give up to come down here and save us? Removed his crown took off his royal robes, everything. So what is it that we're willing to hold on to that will hinder us from being a part of the few? May God speak to your heart powerfully this morning. 
as he is calling us to tell us that the harvest is plentiful. May we have eyes to see where God wants us working today.